So good evening and welcome to the New School. My name is uh, Sean Jacobs and I'm on the faculty of the Graduate Program in International Affairs in the Milano School, along with Tony Caron, who's hiding, who is here tonight. I teach a course, Global Soccer, Global Politics, to a mix of graduate and undergraduate students. We've been doing so on and off since about, what's it, 2011 maybe? After the South Africa World Cup, yeah, 2010 then. Yeah. And hope to grow soccer's presence as a serious area of study at the new school. I just wrote that down, actually. So in fact, we have scattered around the university faculty interested in the, the vagaries of sports, not just football or soccer, and we hope to draw them into a, a larger project when we, when we get to it. So before we continue, let me just thank this, the, the Milano School and International Affairs for sponsoring the talk and also Paolo, uh, sorry, Pablo Medina Uribe right there, who uh, is a young graduate student um, in media studies and also a football writer himself who helped um, make this event happen. So tonight's event is entitled, England is Paradise, the Meaning and Making of English Football, 1985 to 2014, and our speaker is David Goldblatt. The remarkable transformation that David charts in his new book, The Game of Our Lives, it's like the same book with different titles in different countries, on the English Premier League, tells the story of a league described in the wake of the Heysel disaster as a slum game played by slum people in slum stadiums to one that now boasts record audiences globally. For example, in the US alone, the combined television audience for the final of the Premier League, the final day of the Premier League, and the league is here known as the EPL on TV, in 2014 was larger than the UK audience. Um, I won't give anything else away except to let David tell that story himself. So our speaker, David Goldblatt, has been described by a reviewer in London Sunday Times as, quote, the best football historian writing today, as he's possibly, and he's possibly the best there has ever been, unquote. And I also wanted to quote this, a New York City blogger for a blog called World Soccer Talk wrote last week after David's appearance at Nevada Smith's. Most people around the world get soccer. It comes at them packaged in so many ways for their consumption on television, in print, and online. They get it. It is available all the time. In fact, it's even more than available. It is, it is there to indulge in, to feast on, and even to glut on. There are, however, very few people who get soccer. It is all in the level of apprehension, of comprehension, of rooted understanding. Manager, Arsene Wenger, truly gets soccer. I'm not sure about that. As far as players go, Thierry, Thierry Henry truly gets soccer. I agree with that. As far as writers go, David Goldblatt truly gets soccer. So David Goldblatt was born in London and was an academic in a previous life at the Open University in London. In fact, my first introduction to David's work was as a graduate student through the book Global Transformations, Politics, Economics, and Culture, which serves as a textbook in many courses that I've taught or been taught in. David's books include The Ball is Round, A Global History of Football, Just Under a Thousand Pages, and Football Nation, The Story of Brazil Through Soccer, the latter which came out this summer. You can also see David's writing on Al Jazeera, The Guardian, TLS, and as a broadcaster on soccer, soccer documentaries for the BBC. Last but not least, David is a fan of Tottenham Hotspur and Bristol Rovers. I think some people are like, what? So that's it, I think I'll sit down. But before I sit down, I just want to say the format is David will speak for about an hour or so, and then he'll interact with the audience in a sort of very informal way, questions and answers. David. Well, thank you very much for coming out. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here, and I appreciate on an evening as cold as this, it's particularly special of you to come out and see me. Um, I'm going to talk today about my new book, The Game of Our Lives, The Making and the Meaning of English Football, and I'm going to try and do four things. I'm going to start with the whole notion of England as paradise for football, which is a quote from Eric Cantona. Those of you who are not familiar with Eric, he is a pivotal, indeed transitional figure in the history of modern English football. He arrived in England in 1991-92 and won uh, the league title with Leeds United in the last season of what was the old Division I. Um, and uh, then transferred to Manchester United and won with Manchester United the title in the first season of the Premier League, which was then created. Um, He's a transitional figure also because he loved the delirium 
and the theatricality and the extraordinary character of the crowd in English football, which he found, having come from French football, quite incomprehensible in its intensity and passion. And yet his own brilliance and his own play and his own charisma is one of the reasons that the league has proved so successful and become so entirely consumed with money and with the creation of a commercial spectacle that the very thing that he treasured so much when he first arrived in England is in peril. So what did he mean by England is a paradise? How can we begin to break that down and think about what that might mean? Um, I think what first of all it means is that in, in Britain, and in England in particular, football has undergone a complete transformation in its location in the culture as a whole. If we went back 50 years, let's say, and we asked the average punter in England, what's the national game? They probably wouldn't have said football. Most likely they would have said cricket, and they would have had a very reasonable case to be made in terms of television coverage, popular engagement, the amount of space it received in the newspapers, and above all in the idea that cricket in some sense in its imperial, gentlemanly, rural, bucolic form represented something very real about the English nation rather than the urban proletarian version, which is football. But I would say if you asked anyone that question these days, they would instantly say football. There is simply no competitor. But more than just displacing cricket as the national game, the position of um, football in English culture has moved from simply being popular or widespread to being absolutely ubiquitous. You cannot move in any sphere, I would say, of English popular or indeed elite cultures these days without encountering football in some way or another. So how can we measure that? How can we get a sense of this new place of football in English culture? So I'm going to offer you four ways of thinking about it. First of all, to compare um, football to a series of other cultural phenomena, like the theatre or cinema or music, and get some sense of the scale and the significance and the place of football within the culture. Um, secondly, um, I'm going to take a look at um, the degree to which elite cultures and popular cultures have taken on football uh, as a subject of study or inquiry, and how that has increased quite exponentially over the last 30 years. Thirdly, um, in a slightly glib but I think nonetheless important set of evidence, I want to look at the way in which elites in Britain, who previously would never have admitted to any kind of allegiance towards football or a football club, it has become absolutely de rigueur, an absolute essential element of the kind of demotic background of a uh, politician or a senior public figure's life is to reveal who they support and why and what that story is. And then finally, I'm going to take a look at the degree to which football has become part of the language of politics, of art, of a whole series of important discourses, and served as a metaphor in all sorts of ways for the state of the nation. Having done so, I'm then going to ask, how did this happen? Why did it happen? And I'm going to offer you two stories. I'm going to offer you the story that the Premier League tells, which you will probably be familiar with, and then I'm going to systematically demolish it and offer you an alternative explanation. And then I'm going to finish by giving you uh, a little introduction to the content of the book and how it connects to the themes that I've spoken about this evening. So without further ado, let's begin the task of comparison. Football is an odd cultural phenomena with family resemblances to many other but identical to none. In some ways, it's like music culture in the sense that at the top of the tree you have a small, highly specialized, highly commercialized circuit of producers and a vast hinterland of informal and amateur play of different kinds. In another way, I think it's, not, uh, it's comparable to the church. And I don't say that in a glib manner. I don't for a moment believe that football is a religion, despite the language of salvation and praying and the football gods and so on. And delightful as those metaphors are, they ain't true. There is no metaphysics of football. There are no gods of football. There is no holy book. And while we might extract some moral and political lessons from the game of football, to call it a religion is simply absurd. However, it is most certainly a ritual. 
And that, to a great extent, in England at any rate, is how religion functions most of the time. The same people in the same place doing the same thing, imbued with a whole series of complex and important meanings. And that, I have to say, is very much the way football operates in England. And I will give you some examples of that. Um, shorn of its religious dimension, I think football actually clo more closely approximates to a form of popular theatre in which a narrative, albeit spontaneous, is presented to an audience and an audience, a live audience, reacts and engages with it. Though I would say, unlike most theatre in uh, uh, Britain today, it is not just a crowd or an audience that is present, but truly a chorus in the Greek sense of the word that actually shapes, interacts with, and determines the nature of the narrative and the performance before us. Um, and finally, I think there's a case for saying football, certainly in England, operates as a form of soap opera. Soap opera for men, that is, rather than for women who are the main consumers of soap opera otherwise. And people look at me askance when I suggest that. And I said, really, you know, because football's not about individual matches. It's not just about individual moments. We don't consume it in that fashion. What we consume is a multi-layered, multi-narrative complex of stories with many individual characters interacting with each other. You know, I may support Tottenham, but Tottenham is meaningless without Arsenal you know, to dislike. Um, you know, if it were just the case that we only fall out our own team, I mean, what are we going to do this season as Chelsea seems to be romping away with it? But what we're going to do is we're going to loathe Chelsea for being the nouveau riche arrivists that they are. And that's what gives meaning to the overall experience of the league. It's a complex narrative soap opera which offers 24-7 running commentary, albeit in metaphorical form often, on everyday events, be it racism, be it sexism, be it homophobia. And, of course, the individual characters that populate the football world serve in the same way as soap stars. Their um, on-screen and off-screen personas are persistently um, confused and, again, offer a running commentary on national events. So how does football measure up to all of these different things with which it shares these features? Let's start with the question of music. And I think the thing with music in Britain in particular is that it offers an opportunity for collective ecstasy in its live form. I mean, that is the most vibrant part of music culture in, uh, in Britain today. And one of the things you'll note over the last 25 years in Britain is that the number of people attending live music, and above all, live music festivals, large gatherings, has increased astronomically. It has become, reached the point where the Glastonbury Festival, which when I went to back in the day, 30 years ago, um, you know, was a muddy field with 30,000 hippies in it of no great significance to anyone. It now attracts 250,000 people at least. And for my children's generation, it is the defining rite of passage of a teenager in England today is to attend the Glastonbury Festival and get completely off your head with the rest of your generation. Um, that's about five full houses, I reckon, at Old Trafford. And if you add all of the music festivals up, it doesn't even begin to compare with the attendance of the, in the Premier League, let alone the rest of football. And while Glastonbury and while music festivals and while musical culture still offer opportunities for creating distinct youth subcultural identities, they are as nothing these days to the degree to which football and football clubs offer the opportunity for creating imagined civic communities in the many towns and cities of Britain. So at the level of collective ecstasy, football just tops, just tops music and kicks it, as we say in England, into a cocked hat. What about the church? Well, obviously there are many churches, um, but I start with the Church of England, the state church uh, in the country, the most well attended, and I calculate it's approximately a million people a week are attending the Church of England in some form or another. During the season, if we take the FA Cup and the League Cup into account in the same way that we would take weddings and funerals into account alongside the Sunday service, it's over 750,000 and rising.
and you have a graph of church attendance that is doing that, and you have a graph of football attendance that is doing this, and I predict in a couple of years they will cross, and more people will be attending football rituals than attending Anglican Christian rituals. Much more significantly, no one is rushing home from church on Sunday to catch the highlights later on in television. So in the realm of ritual, as well as in the realm of, um, of ecstasy, football is a serious competitor. Then we go to theatre, and it's interesting in the realm of theatre that most theatre people barely acknowledge the existence of football. The very idea that football was a serious cultural competitor to, uh, to the theatrical establishment would have been inconceivable even 10 years ago. And now I note that the uh, umbrella organization for the British theater industry regularly announces in the years that they manage to outsell the Premier League that the theater's selling more tickets than the Premier League. To which I say, wow, you, the Premier League may not sell more tickets, but that you think it is a competitor to the entire genre of theatrical drama. You know, there are 92 football clubs in the professional leagues. There are hundreds upon hundreds of regional theatres, and football is outselling them pretty much. So in the realm of narrative performance, in the realm of collective ecstasy, in the realm of ritual, football exceeds all of these things. And then soap opera. I mean, while the soap opera audiences are probably on balance on television slightly larger, um, it remains the case that at peak performance, um, the England national team will pull in more viewers than ever watch EastEnders or Coronation Street. And the amount of space that is currently devoted to the ongoing narratives within football by comparison to soap opera, I would say is now exceeding it. So football actually gives all of these different elements of popular culture in, uh, in England a run for their money. And none of them individually can even begin to compete with football across those different realms of social interaction. So the last 25, 20, 25 years have seen this enormous growth in all of these fields. But perhaps even more tellingly is to look at what's happened in football in English culture. Let's start with the poetry. I have scanned for my sins the 20th century canon of English poetry. And I would say prior to the 1980s, there are no more than three or four poems that actually deal with football at any length. Philip Larkin, the great Philip Larkin, one of the most important and influential poets of the post-war era, managed one reference to football in a uh, poem about the First World War, in which he compared the cues of people signing up for the King's Shilling in 1914 to the crowd at Villa Park in Birmingham. Seamus Heaney, uh, Nobel Prize winner, Ted Hughes, another great post-war poet, have both written one poem each about football, childhood recollections of a kickabout game. And in the case of Seamus Heaney, one that of course descends into a debate about, yep, my father digs turf, I'm going to be a writer, now I'm playing football. So it's pretty standard form. Ted Hughes' poem, Football at Slack, is absolutely superb, and I recommend that just as a very lovely piece of poetry. But that is pretty meager pickings from a hundred years of poetry. T.S. Eliot, um, W.B. Yeats uh, are not writing a great deal about football. Um, but in the last 30 years, the relationship between poetry and football has become very intimate. The poet laureate Andrew Motion for 10 years in the 1990s um, not only wrote a couple of uh, poems about football, but actively campaigned for the creation of a football laureate, recognizing the intimate connection between football chants, football singing, and football traditions, and the rhythm and the rhyme of, con of conventional poetry. Simon Armitage, um, who is one of the uh, most popular youthful poets, uh, in Britain today, actually described, he said, I've always thought poets were the goalkeepers of the literary world, a sense of their kind of old man outness. Caroline Duffy, who is the current poet laureate 
uh, in England, actually wrote as one of her earliest poems in this position an ode to David Beckham's Metatarsals, which was then reproduced across not merely the popular press, but the serious press. And I just ask you to pause for a moment the idea that the Times would publish a poem by a woman poet laureate about David Beckham's metatarsals is so inconceivable. Even 15 or 20 years ago, it marks a very significant change. But it's not just at this jokey level that it's important. It's actually you find football deeply embedded in some of the most important and interesting poetic work of the last 30 years. I alert you to Tony Harrison's epic, almost Homeric length poem, V, which is an extraordinary account of the deindustrialization of the north of Britain and the social misery and dislocation that came with it. And at its very heart is football imagery. The V that is used in the title is persistently reused within the poem in the sense of verses. Football imagery of conflict, of rise and decline, runs through this poem. Similarly, Don Patterson, one of the most interesting poets in contemporary Scotland, published an entire collection called Nil Nil, in which he took a declining West of Scotland amateur football club as his metaphor for the collapse of small town industrial Scotland. Um, and football clubs have responded, interestingly. We actually have about 15 football clubs now in England that have their own laureate and their own in-house poet. Who would have thought that English football clubs would have had an in-house poet? So poetry has made great leaps and bounds. In the world of English letters, it has not been dissimilar. Uh, once again, if you um, take a look at the, um, at the canon of the 20th century, despite the importance of football, you will find almost nothing before the early 1990s. J.B. Priestley's book, English Journey, is one of the very few um, great works of English literature in the 20th century which actually engages with football. Uh, and it's interesting, English Journey is a sort of tour around um, small town and uh, metropolitan England in the 1930s. And there's a absolutely superb account of a game between Notts County uh, and Nottingham Forest within it. And then you go and look at Orwell. Orwell, the man who's meant to know and describe English culture and English working class culture better than any other mid-century writer. And you go on the road to Wigan Pier, his tour through the cultures of northern working class England. And does he go to the football? No, he doesn't. It's just extraordinary. You claim to understand English working class culture of the interwar era and you don't go to the football. It's like, what culture are you going to? And he's not alone in this. I mean, I could reel off a whole series of people who have done the English journey, the state of the nation, who are the English, and they simply have not engaged with football. A remarkable absence. Um, and there is, of course, a sort of deep anti-sport thing going on inside the English intelligentsia for reasons too complex to deal with now. But in the early 1990s, this finally began to break. So the London Review of Books, which is the equivalent of the New York Review of Books, a completely football-free zone in the 1980s, suddenly is publishing uh, diaries on the World Cup. It's offering peons to, um, to Paul Gascoigne. Carl Miller, who you would not have thought as a football fan, the editor and f one of the founders of the magazine, is writing superb work on this. And suddenly the male literary elite, and it is the male literary elite at this point, are writing extensively on football. Martin Amos, Julian Barnes, Nick Horn, Blake Morrison, a whole series of um, of people writing on football, giving it a cachet and a status that it has never, never had before in English, um, in English letters. So there's a transformation. The cinema is another area where English football has gone from almost nothing to being, again, ubiquitous. I calculate that between the 1930s and the 1980s, there are no more than five or six football films, really, of any significance in England. And they are all bad. Um, the Arsenal Stadium mystery in the 1930s is basically a crappy who done it that just happens to be set in Highbury. Um, 
some of you will be familiar with Escape to Victory, which is the prisoner of World War II, prisoner of war escape movie with a football match in it. Uh, Pelé gives his extraordinary cardboard performance as Pelé. Sylvester Stallone does I Know Not What, but he is in the movie. And it is truly one of the worst films ever made. Only topped by the movie uh, that Pele made in the 1970s called Os Trombadinos. If you ever get the chance to watch that on YouTube, I, I send you that way. You'll laugh till you cry. Um, even a movie like Gregory's Girl, um, which is a fantastically sweet, lovely movie, you know, in which um, the girls are better than the boys at football. In the end, it's not really a football movie. It's a beautiful movie about teenage life. It's a beautiful coming of age movie. It's a great love story. It's not a football movie. No one has really been able to crack it. But again, in the last 20 to 25 years, I calculate something between 30 or 40 football movies have been made in uh, Britain, many of them with American money. As you will know, the desperate attempt to bend the experience of football to the Hollywood arc of beats and loving and hugging and learning in the third act has been tried again and again, and it never works. But they keep on coming back for it in When Saturday Comes or Goal. We've also had the most extraordinary slew of hooligan movies. Again, something that no one would have considered making a film about. I have to ask if anybody knows why anyone thought it was a good idea for Frodo to be playing a hooligan in the East End of London. Come and tell me. Those of you who have not seen Green Street, you can give that one a miss. Just take that one off the list. Um, I could go on about the bad movies. Let me alert you, though, to the fact that there have been some good ones. Um, Looking for Eric is an extraordinary movie made by Ken Loach, um, which is a kind of Mancunian magic realism in which a pot-smoking Eric Cantona appears to a postman having a nervous breakdown uh, and uh, sorts him, both his footballing and his emotional life out. Similarly, the uh, Damned United, based on David Peace's coruscating novel about the last 40 days that Brian Clough spent at Leeds United in the 1970s, as well as being an extraordinarily literary document, has probably been the most successful film at depicting something and capturing something of the significance of uh, football in England in the 1970s. Um, television which you would have thought would have done a lot of football back in the day, produced no more than five or six documentaries of any significance in 30 years, and otherwise was confined to the usual collection of tedious highlight shows uh, and the occasional live match. Once again, in the last 25 years, we have just seen an explosion of, um, of football-related uh, material, um, drama in particular, which no one, would have touched 20 years ago. And now you have Sky producing Dream Team. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a truly appalling football soap opera. Uh, and by the end of it, those of you who uh, who were fans of Dynasty and Dallas back in the day and the kind of implausible plot lines they had to construct by Series 10, that's where it ended up. But the significance for us is there it is, 250 episodes of a football soap opera being put out. And it was not alone. Uh, in that level of uh, that level of coverage, um, so that's an extraordinary transformation. An extraordinary transformation to have occurred. Um, what about the question of elites? I mean, again, let me let me tell you a little bit about Eng- British prime ministers and their relationship to football. Again, it's just a guide to the place of the game in the wider culture. Clement Attlee, the prime minister in 1945, the creator of the. Uh, this war welfare state, was a cricket fan and was known to slip out of number 10 Downing Street, jump in a taxi and go to Lords to watch the cricket on occasion when things weren't too busy in the cabinet office. But no interest in football whatsoever. Winston Churchill, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, was not a football man. He liked hunting, shooting, fishing, killing animals, being beastly to them, all the things you would expect of the English aristocracy. Um, I think he quite liked fencing as well. Then we have three elderly conservative gentlemen, uh, Macmillan, Eden, and Hume, who follow him, none of whom have any interest in football, but Macmillan and Hume were both very considerable cricketers, and this takes us back to the notion I was saying earlier. If we were talking about this in the 50s or 60s, people would have been going, football? Surely if you want the soul of England, you should be looking at cricket. Um, 
And so the first Prime Minister actually to take any kind of notice of football in post-war Britain is Harold Wilson, and the first sort of true populist to occupy the post, I would say. And he made the most of the 1966 World Cup victory, appeared on the balcony with the boys at the Kensington Gardens Hotel, and made some play of his relationship with Huddersfield, which was the town that he represented in the north of England. But it was never really more than skin deep. Edward Heath, Prime Minister 1970 to 74, had no connection with football whatsoever. He liked to play the piano and go sailing. And then, of course, we have Mrs. Thatcher. I'm sure you're all familiar with Dear Margaret. And it would be fair to say that Mrs. Thatcher loathed and detested football with an intensity only exceeded by her loathing and detestation of the organized working classes and trade unions. And had she been around for longer, she probably would have done to football what she did to the trade union movement in uh, England, which was to stuff it. Um, and so the first prime minister to genuinely actually engage and like football in Britain is as late as 1992. John Major, who once again is a cricket fan and actually a rather interesting scholar of cricket, having written a social history of the game, did like to nip off and watch Chelsea on occasion and was quite serious about it. But the step change, the step change in the status of the game comes in the mid-1990s with the arrival of Tony Blair. And his um, chief of staff, his main man, was a man called Alistair Campbell, an obsessive Burnley fan uh, and tabloid journalist private prior to taking on this job. And he could read the runes of British culture. And he realized that if he wanted to turn Blair into a popular and populist figure, perhaps the easiest and most direct way was to associate him with football. So from the mid-1990s, Alistair Campbell is penning uh, articles in Tony Blair's name in the tabloid press, but using football as the way in. You know, the terrible neoliberalism of the Conservative Party, the appalling rule of money over social need, all of these things could be expressed in populist columns on football. But more than that, more than that, then Campbell starts arranging for Blair and his family to appear in the director's box or in the royal box at Euro 96 when England are playing the semi-final against Germany. You've got the Queen, you've got Prince Philip, and what do you know? There's Tony Blair and his whole family looking like the Prime Minister in waiting, which was, of course, the purpose of the exercise. More than this, we find that in this era, all of the sort of junior henchmen of the Labour Party, people who are now, people like Ed Miliband, who, oh my God, might actually be Prime Minister, we will see in the near future, they all cut their teeth inside the Labour Party playing in a uh, kickabout game on a Sunday. Uh, and it becomes the currency of networking and connection in a way that it has never done before. I won't bore you with it now, but I'm pretty sure I can tell you every single member of the shadow cabinet in the Labour Party these days which football team they support. Again, inconceivable in an earlier era. And it's not just been the Labour Party, even the Conservatives these days, who for the most part disdain football, and they prefer either country sports back to killing animals, um, or um, in the case of William Hague, he rather like judo, and the awful George Osborne, who is our Secretary of State for Finance, seems to rather prefer video games. Um, but someone like Michael Howard, who was the Conservative Party leader in 2005, actually made a series of public statements, including one in the House of Commons, on whether Gerard Houllier was making the right decisions at Liverpool. Extraordinary that such a thing should be said. The City of London has made it very public on very, all occasions where their allegiances lie. So we know which teams the last three governors of the Bank of England have supported. And indeed, Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Bank of England for over 10 years, when he was on radio on a program called Desert Island Discs, which is basically you go on radio, you say, these are my seven favorite songs. This is what I take to the Desert Island with me. And then what's his number one, if he lost all the other six? A really terrible song from Aston Villa's 1982 triumph in the European Cup. And that's what the governor of the Bank of England, he actually says, you know, I think it's actually harder to run a Premier League club than it is to be the chair of the Bank of England. At one point, at one point, both the chief rabbi and the Archbishop of Canterbury were very public Arsenal supporters. 
Even the Queen has announced that she is an Arsenal supporter, much to my chagrin. Wherever I go, I seem to find Arsenal supporters. So this is, I mean, you know, this is partly co coded references by an elite that is desperate to establish some sort of demotic credibility. Um, but it also just speaks to the sheer power, the ubiquity, and the importance of football in the wider culture. What about language? Well, I think as in the United States over the last 30 years, we've experienced an extraordinary period of rising inequality. And one of the ways that inequality is expressed is in the language of premium services, business classes, extra comfort, all of those little things that if you've got the money distinguish you from the 90%, thus the Premier League. And if I could just... Um, just a couple of quotes I wanted to read you on, uh, on this. So, for example, you find the Booker Prize, which you may know, it's the big literary prize in the UK. So, The Independent, in 1997, announces that Margaret Atwood is in the Premier League of World Novelists. I mean, the literary elite have never used that kind of language. Or you find uh, the Royal Society, which is the most prestigious scientific institution in uh, Britain, a place where many of the most fundamental laws of physics right, were first demonstrated in experimental proof. This is where Newton and Boyle and all of those dudes went. And they wrote... Over the last 250 years, Britain has always been first or second in the Premier League of Science. And it's like, really? You're going to talk about science in the 18th century in terms of the Premier League? But my favourite of all, which suggests just how far the cultural status of football has been, uh, has been transformed, is the art world. And the art world is not a place, really, that football had any purchase until very, rather recently. I'm going to demonstrate what an old man I am now, because I can't actually read with these glasses on. Um, so this was written. This was written of Damien Hurst. Are we all familiar with the horrible Damien Hurst? I'm a genius at making money. I wish I could do that bit of his job. Damien Hurst's split from his long-standing gallery was seen in terms of the football transfer market. It's not so much that these are defections, more that artists are more in control, said the curator and academic Andrew Renton. It's like premiership football. Why did Manchester City not get Robin Van Persie when they offered more than Manchester United? When you're already worth tens of millions... It's not just about money. Extraordinary. And then we turn finally to the, um, to the leader columns, to the op-eds. And once again, I scanned, scanned the past. Nobody ever used football as a way of describing the state of the nation. But in the last decade or so, commentators of both left and right simply cannot stop. And let me just give you a little illustration of a couple of those. So you have... Uh, Jonathan Friedland, writing in The Guardian after the Glazers family's leverage buyout of Manchester United, compared the deal to Kraft's buy-up of Cadbury, which is a, a confectionery manufacturer. And he wrote, Selling off the crown jewels of our collective culture in the name of a rampant capitalism that is both unsustainable and ultimately joyless, this doesn't sound like the state of the national game. This sounds like the state of the nation. And then on the other side, you get the right. So you get our old friend Peter Hitchens in the Daily Mail, who asked, is football a pagan cult? And he concluded, given the failures of liberal Christianity in the country, that it probably was. Indeed, he wearily accepted that fact. But then finished up, this is just classic Peter Hitchens, um, uh, with uh, his uh, problem with their shallow 90-minute popular nationalism. And he wrote... I am almost permanently furious that they can rush onto the streets to show patriotism over a football game, but appear unmoved by the theft of our national independence, the rape of our countryside, the destruction of our culture, and all the many real and lasting ways in which the country daily loses the real World Cup of nations. So we've reached a point in England where from being either marginal or indeed, as Sean suggested earlier, you know, depicted as the game of the kind of, you know, lumpen proletariat and the underclass, a slum game played in slum stadiums watched by slum people, 
it is now absolutely the sinusure, the very center of the meaning of British culture and public life. So how did we get here? How did this happen? Well, the story that the Premier League will tell you is a pretty standard and pretty tedious economic argument that we've all heard our elites tell over and over again. One based on what I call the L'Oreal principle. Yeah, because I'm worth it. Because they always, they always make the argument, be it bankers, be it industrialists, be it the people who run sports leagues. It's like, we made it all. Of course we did. We're the people who did all of this, and therefore we are entitled to garner and sequester away all of the riches that have come with it. And what I want to say to the bankers, and what I want to say to the EP, people who run the EPL is, it's not true. You didn't make it by yourself. Actually, we all made it. You may have been able to sequester all the value away in it, but you didn't make it. In fact, you probably stole it. So what's the argument that the Premier League make? Well, it's a pretty standard neoliberal argument. There was a completely useless rust bucket of an underinvested industry with a dying market. And then the genius of private entrepreneurship and private ownership came along and brought commercial chutzpah and commercial energy and new investment and an understanding of the great new technologies and the new medias. And hey presto, more comfortable stadiums, better product on view, no violence. Of course, everybody then comes to the football. And of course, there's some truth in that. But there's a lot isn't true. So the first thing to say about that is, um, was it a tabula rasa before they came, when the Premiership, because Sky Television and the Premier League would like you to think that English football history started in 1992. Not true. Not true at all. First of all, there was a very complex system of economic regulations in English football that had been established by the Football Association in the early 20th century. And they did this because they recognized football is not a conventional business. Right? There need to be various forms of regulation and protection to ensure that sporting needs and social needs take priority over economic needs. So the first thing that was established in the 1890s is that you could only take 7.5% of your profit and pay it as dividends, which meant, in effect, that you couldn't really pay dividends even if you were able to make a profit. Secondly, they ensured that there was revenue sharing devices because some clubs were large and some clubs were small. And if you wanted a decent league, you needed a measure of competitive balance. And so there were a whole series of regulations that ensured that gates in particular, which were the main way in which clubs actually earned their money before the advent of television, those were shared out. Above all, they had devices to prevent you selling off the football stadium right, to a supermarket and then running off with the money. And the deal was that if you try and liquidate a football club, you have to give the money to a sporting charity. You can't just take it yourself. So all of these devices had to be circumvented or broken in the same way that you know, the deregulation of capital markets and the creation of the monstrous banking industry that we had today was built on and premised on destroying almost a century of regulation that existed prior to it. The key device in this was the holding company. Irving Scholar, the um, chairman of Tottenham Hotspurs in 1985, realized that if you wanted to float your football club on the stock market and actually extract some value from it, the only way to do it was to create a shell company, Tottenham Hotspurs PLC. And Tottenham Hotspurs PLC would own Tottenham Football Club, but would not be regulated in the same way. So you could move the money from Tottenham Hotspurs Football Club to Tottenham Hotspurs PLC, and then all of those old and irritating regulations that were there to ensure equality, competitive balance, and social need prioritized over economic need would disappear. The magic alchemy of shyster lawyers. Um, and they wrote to the Football Association. They wrote to the Football Association and said, this is what we're going to do. Brackets, we're going to transform football in the process. And what did the Football Association do? Nothing. They didn't even reply to the letter. In fact, I'm not sure they even opened the letter. But it was a complete 
an utter dereliction of duty and governance. So that's phase one in making it happen. Phase two. Well, phase two is that you had to have some new stadiums. And as I'm sure you're all aware, English football was beset by a whole series of problems of social disorder and conflict through the 1970s and 1980s. But what actually brought about stadiums having to have seats, football clubs actually having to have safety officers, of actually treating your punters as if they were citizens rather than uh, a potential riot and a public order problem, was only brought about by the force of the state. There were many, many, many occasions in the post-war era where people begged the Football League and the owners of football clubs to transform the nature of their stadiums, spend some money on it, and stupid them rather than police them. From 1948, when 38 people died at Burnden Park in a terrible crush at Bolton in an FA Cup final, just read the report. It's pretty much the Taylor report for Hillsborough 40 years later saying, you can't go on like this, you've got to spend some money, it's dangerous if you've got terraces in the form that you have it. But of course, as we know with the private sector, they don't necessarily do the right or the rational thing. In fact, all the football clubs, well, I'm not going to do it because if I do it and nobody else does, then we won't have any money and then we'll get demoted and the problem of collective action arises. Which, of course, is why we have the state. Because sometimes we need to enforce collective action on individual actors if we are to get a rational outcome. And it was only the Hillsborough disaster, the death of 96 people in that disaster, and the appalling and disgusting behavior of the authorities and the police still, still not completely settled, um, that brought about the change. There would have been no change without it. More significantly, one quarter of the capital costs of building the new stadiums of the English Premier League were paid for by the taxpayer, right? And did we get a cut? I mean, you know, Chelsea's, one quarter of Chelsea's new stands were built with taxpayers' money. Do we own any of Chelsea? Doesn't look like it to me. Where did the rest of the money come from? Did it come from the new entrepreneurs? Did they dip into their pockets? Oh, no. What they did was one of two things, usually both. Someone like Sir John Hall, the man who transferred Newcastle United, did he put up money? No, he lent money to Newcastle United at an interest rate double that of the conventional banks at the time. So this is kind of form of legalized loan sharkery to your own football club. And where that method wouldn't work, they just put the prices of the tickets up. And in a price inelastic market where fans pay whatever, that's what funded it. Um, I'll just have a little straw poll here. If you take account of inflation, right, take inflation out of the equation, what do you think the increase of the price of a season ticket at Anfield has been over the last 20 years in percentage terms? 100% will be doubling. So what do you reckon? Go on, have a guess. Go on. 400, 2,000, <laughs> it's a thousand percent, and that's after inflation. So I have to say, if that is entrepreneurial genius, you know, I'm giving that an IQ of about four, right? You've got a captive audience, and then you just raise the prices, and then you take the taxpayer's money. This is not entrepreneurial genius. This is called taking the mickey. Um, and then there's the question of the product. And as the Premier League is forever telling us, the football's better. And they're right, the football is better now. But was the football better in 1992? I watched the Premier League in 1992 when Norwich came third. And I can tell you, and do you know how many foreign players there were that season in the Premier League? 13, all right? So there was no change. The football being played for the first three or four years of the Premier League it's the same old crap we were watching before in slightly more comfortable stadiums, plus Eric Cantona and then Dennis Bergkamp. And I agree, that's a pretty good combination. But it's not enough to transform the entire character of football. Moreover, have a look one day at the graph of audience attendance. You would think that the dip, the bottom, 1992, and then the Premier League came along and the graph suddenly goes up. Not true. In fact, the lowest attendance for football 
in Britain um, was 1985, the year of Heisel and the Bradford fire. And amazingly, even in the year of Hillsborough, 1989, the graph is rising and rising. Hillsborough doesn't lead to less people going to football. More people go to the football the year after Hillsborough than the year of Hillsborough. So something else is happening. By 1992, you've got seven or eight years of audience growth. The premiership then piggybacks on. So what's going on here? You know, you have to actually get out of an economics kind of mode of thinking. And I have to say, you know, those of you who've ever been to Bristol Rovers, for example, who are my main team in the fifth level of English football, and um, anyone who tells you that people are going to football for the football alone are not going to Bristol Rovers, all right? Because it's not good. And there's no excuse for ignorance anymore. We all know what the Champions League looks like, right? We all watch it on a Tuesday and a Wednesday, right? And we know what the very best football looks like. And that's not what it looks like at Bristol Rovers. And yet there we are, 5,000 of us, paying up 20 bucks to stand and watch them. And that's the point. We're not just going for the football. We're going for something else, okay? What is that something else that the Premiership, because there's such a bunch of narrow-minded economists, can't even begin to imagine? I mean, I kind of think with the Premier League, I think, really, dudes, have you been to any football recently? Because most of it, it's not about being, it's not about the football. Um, the sharpest rise and the record levels of attendance at English football are post-war Britain, 1945 to 1951. In 1939, about 30 million people are going to see the football every season. 1945, it's suddenly 38 million. And by 1951, the peak year, it's 44 million. Was the football better after the Second World War in the stadiums that had all been bombed and amongst the players who hadn't properly trained for six years, amongst the teams that had not been together for six years? Of course it wasn't. It was complete crap. But that's not what people were going for. You know, you've just done six years of total war. You've got all of these young men, and it was predominantly young men demobbed, this is a flash of color, of excitement in the unbearable boredom and drabness and awfulness of post-war Britain. I mean, you guys have to remember, the immediate post-war um, uh, period in America is a period of optimism, of growth, of transformation. And in Britain, it rains for six years, and everything's on rationing, and it's miserable. And people go to the football a sense of normality, a sense of camaraderie established during the war but no longer available most of the time. A whole series of complex arguments. And this is above all what the neoliberal accounts of English football have completely missed. And in so doing, it allows them to tell the complete lie to themselves that their minimalist, cack-handed economic intervention and form of what I would say is a form of um, enclosure. You know, this is like the enclosure of the commons back in the 18th century. You know, there was all of that land and all that wood that everybody was able to use and it was pretty loose regulation and everyone understood that it wasn't being run on conventional economic lines. It was a shared resource. Well, that's what football clubs were. They were social enterprises. These things were not businesses. Nobody ever made any money out of them. I mean, not that anybody makes any money out of football. And it's worth noting that for all the entrepreneurial genius of the Premier League, it has never, ever made profits. Extraordinary. If you take tax and the capital account right, into the equation, not a single season has passed in which the Premier League collectively has made money. And this is at a time when its revenues have increased perhaps 15 times over. I mean, do you know any businesses that can increase their revenue 15 times over and still not be earning any money? And these people are meant to be an exemplar of entrepreneurial genius. I mean, do I laugh? Do I cry? Do I throw up? It is, it is one of the great illusions of our age. It's the same as the banking industry, right? Which turns all that money over. And then you go, how come you guys are riddled with debt? 
How come you guys get away with stealing? And how come we think you're the center of the economy? The same ideological illusions in a less serious form are at work in the English Premier League. So if we are to take the line that I'm suggesting from the end of the Second World War and say there's something cultural here, which explains not merely the enormous attendance at football, but also this incredible kind of cultural elevation. What is it? What is it that Eric Cantona sensed when he described England as a paradise for football? So the argument that I make in the book, and which I can only begin to sketch now, but if I had to reduce it to a kind of slogan, would be to say that English football is a social democratic game in a neoliberal world. Neoliberal, you can see, that's the easy bit. But what do I mean that it's a social democratic game? Football, in England, its cultural basis is established from around the First World War until the 1970s. And while the football clubs tended to be owned or had directors drawn from the middle classes, it was overwhelmingly a working class industrial game. Um, you know, and shaped by the tastes and the predilections of the overwhelmingly male bit of the English working classes, whose appetite for watching, playing, following, and talking about the game was simply insatiable for about 50 years. How has that lived on? Because one of the remarkable things about the timing of football's decline and rise is that it is almost entirely coterminous with the fate of the English working class and its institutions. It is characteristic of the 1980s that all of the major institutions of working class life in Britain, be it heavy industry, production line factories, trade unions, the cooperative movement, the Labour Party itself, pubs, right, as opposed to wine bars, all of these things were either institutionally destroyed by the Conservative government of the era, swept away by demographic trends, or culturally reviled. And yet, after all of that, what is the one working class cultural institution truly left standing? It's football. How does that manifest itself? What does it mean to say that it's a working class, industrial, social democratic game? I can give you a few examples. So let's just start with the question of language. It always amuses me hugely when um, people talk about football as wages. I don't know how these words work in the United States, but when you say wage in England, you mean a brown paper envelope, right, with notes in it that you get at the end of the week. Footballers have salaries paid direct to their banks, or in the case of many English football clubs, some sort of weird tax evasion device with the money going to some you know, offshore bank account. But whatever it is, it sure as hell isn't wages. Or you'll often find English commentators, and I even begin to hear this amongst the English commentators in the United States, who will say of a player who's worked jolly hard during the game, they'll say, oh, he's put in a good shift, and you think, shift? Isn't that what you do at River Rouge or some car plant or some nightmare steel factory? This is not. But of course, that's the language. Or then, you may again have heard this in the post-match analysis, right? Players of in England often refer to the gaffer. I mean, no one talks about the gaffer anymore unless you're on a building site. That is the language of the building site, of the factory. The foreman is the gaffer. Or even better, you know, when the managers, like even Arsene Wenger does this, and he says, oh, they're a good bunch of lads. You go, bunch of lads? You cannot be serious. You're talking about multi-millionaires, junior members of the super rich, and you're calling them a bunch of lads, like, you know, they're apprentices in some factory. This is completely absurd. So the language of football is suffused with that working class culture. Um, the iconography of English football is indisputably working class. And then let's just think for a moment about its geography. You may not be familiar with this, but um, England is one of the most geographically divisive countries and centralized countries in the world. London is like New York and Washington and Los Angeles 
all rolled into one, right? So finance, high culture, you know, low culture, and the federal government all in one city. And as a consequence, in the last 30 years, we've seen an extraordinary transfer of power and wealth and status from north to south. And yet, what is the capital of English football? It's Manchester. In no other realm of English popular culture, indeed any realm of English culture, does the north of England take priority over the capital and the south. And where was the English Industrial Revolution forged? Where was the English working class housed? Where was the English trade union ma made in the north of England? And this is the only place these days that that massive contribution and a massive part of English life is uh, fixed. Football kicks off at 3 o'clock on a Saturday in England. Why? Why? And why is it such a big deal? Well, of course, that stems from the fact that in the late 18th, 19th century, trade unions finally won the half-day weekend on a Saturday. Everyone had Sunday off, but you got the half-day on a Saturday, which means you knocked off work at 1, home for lunch and a pint, and then you went to the football. The basic rhythm of working class life, or of working class male life in that era. And although we live in postmodern times now, right, where everybody's working life and family life is completely off of that, there is a deep and powerful nostalgia in English football for a three o'clock kickoff. It drives people completely insane. Middlesbrough, at one point when they were in the UEFA Cup, went half a season without a kickoff at 3 p.m. on a Saturday. And this is, you know, from a culture that's forgotten what factory work was, and yet deep in our guts, 3 p.m. on a Saturday is absolutely precious. In survey after survey, that's what people want. So I suppose the argument that I end up making, um, if you like, that's the industrial and working class part, but then there's the social democratic element. And I would say the common sense of English football culture amongst the fans, and this is still the case, is that though they recognize football is a commercial business, no one is utopian about this, somebody has to pay for the circus, there is a deep and profound sense that money should not always triumph, that even where you have a commercial situation, there must be regulations, there must be controls, there must be a sense of what the common and collective good is and that if economic power has to be restrained and reshaped to ensure that, that is what needs to be done. Similarly, English football, like all football cultures, celebrates individual brilliance. But in the end, in the end, it's about collective endeavor. The key cliche, of course, of the footballers who say, when you say, so did you, how was it when you scored that goal? And they say, oh, it was great to score the goal, but the really important thing is the three points. Now, it's a terrible old cliche, but it speaks to a world in which common ends and collective endeavor truly triumphs over individualism. And I can't speak for this country, but I know in England, life is increasingly about I, 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 me, 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 me. And football, at least at the level of the collective imagination, remains a place which is about us which is about we. And if that is not the kind of core ideological and emotional feature of social democracy, I don't know what is. Um, so in that sense, football has kept the memories of that era and those values imaginatively alive. Um, and I find that in a whole series of places. Now, I'm not going to be rose-tinted about it because, of course, the social democracy of the early 20th century was also very sexist, very racist, very homophobic, very authoritarian and paternalistic. But hey, so was everything else in Britain. Social democracy had no monopoly on those things. So these values that have otherwise been squeezed out of the public realm, I believe, have been imaginatively kept alive in English football. How long have I got, by the way? Because I'm like rolling here. I haven't got a clue what time it is. Where are we? Shall I just keep rolling? OK, I'm going to finish up pretty soon, because I think we should have a con conversation about this. Um, and I explore this in the book. And the way I explore this is in a whole series of uh,
a whole series of ways. You'll find in the book a chapter on the economics which re attempts to retell the story rather than the Premier League's neoliberal triumph actually as an act of collective enclosure. Uh, and then the appalling sell-off of the family silver, as Britain has done with almost everything else of public and collective value in the country, um, to private individuals, both our own domestic idiots as well as a whole bunch of foreign idiots. Um, secondly, I explore the way in which we have completely failed in England to find the political will, the political tools and the political institutions to define the common good. And this is true of the way in which we run our economy, the way in which we run our education system, and indeed the way in which we run our football. And it is exemplified by the Football Association. Now I know here in the United States, as in elsewhere, football associations are pretty bloody awful wherever you go. But the English Football Association has seen the most remarkable dereliction of duty. You know, they were on watch when this happened. And instead of having the intellectual and moral chutzpah to actually do something about it, they just waved it through, which is not unlike much of our political class and much of the institutions of English civil society. Um, there have been gains, of course. You know, the uh, racism of the 1970s and 1980s amongst the crowd has almost disappeared. And this reflects, indeed, has been a major contributor to the transformation of attitudes to race and ethnicity in public life, where it has now become rightly inconceivable to use racial epithets uh, and insults in public life. Of course, in football as elsewhere, this has come at the price of the hidden forms of institutional racism being ignored. Because, oh, the only racists in football are hooligans, aren't they? Oh, and not the dudes who are in charge of the clubs. And on that fact, it, you might well note um, there are um, 92 football clubs in the professional uh, football league. Um, the entire managerial workforce is drawn from ex-players. Black players make up 25% of the labor force. They make up 4% of managers, and that's of junior managers and coaching staff, and currently less than 2% of actual coaches in the, Premier Le in the uh, Football League. And you think, really? This is about educational differences? I don't think so. This is about institutional racism. Uh, similarly, the um, stadiums, as I've said, have become warmer, um, you know, violence has completely uh, disappeared, policing has been transformed, um, but this has come at a terrible cost, and the cost has been that we just don't sing like we used to, and I spend a great deal of time exploring the way in which the match day experience has been transformed, and the attempt of the media sporting complex to turn it into an entirely commercial spectacle. And it's one of the great things about English football that we are still just about singing. Indeed, given the degree of policing and stewarding and demographic change in the audience, it's a bit of a miracle that anyone is still singing anymore. Um, and it's a very telling fact, though, that the average age of the Premier League audience, which was 26 in 1992, is now 45. And bless 45-year-old men. You know, they're great, but they just don't make an atmosphere like a bunch of youth. And it's now less than 7% of the audience is under 25. 7%. I mean, really? What kind of atmosphere do you think? I mean, and it's getting older. And they're all bald and really badly dressed. And, oh, man, it's such a selection of unironed masculinity at English football these days. Um, so there are pros and cons. You know, there have been advances but there have been these very, very serious reverses. And in a way, I think English football, like much of English society, is trapped in a very peculiar dilemma, where its kind of inner culture and its inner values and its political and moral imagination remain tied to the best of industrial working class England, now long past and long gone, but must operate under a political and economic conditions which nurture their very opposite. And so with that thought, I'm just going to end with the words, slightly unbelievably, of John Milton, a 17th century radical Protestant poet who wrote the great poem Paradise Lost. And if Eric Cantona is right that England is a paradise for football, where the collective ecstasy of the crowd 
and the moral values and the moral imagination that football generates puts us in touch with a lost and venerated world, albeit under these neoliberal conditions, then I really can't think of anything better than Milton to describe the experience of English football. And he wrote these words in his great poem, Paradise Regained. The happy place imparts to thee no happiness, no joy, rather inflames thy torment, representing lost bliss to thee no more communicable, so never more in hell than when in heaven. And I think with Milton's words, I'll leave it and pass it over to you. Questions, questions. Who would like to start? I'm sure you're all out there. You look like you've got a question on your lips, sir. No. Uh, sir. David, I'm working class culture at the heart of the game and at the heart of, of what English football is. And, and the English, so, so the tension between the working class heart of English football and the way the game is organized now as a business and the business interests and so on. It strikes me, though, that actually, in some ways, the commercial appeal, from a business point of view, of what English football is, relies very heavily on that heart, on that passion. The television revenues, particularly the global television revenues, rely on that spectacle that's created, which isn't simply about the game. We know that the quality of the game, maybe in, in, in La Liga, often is, is, is better. Yet, in terms of its appeal as a television spectacle, nothing competes with English football. And Yet, the, as you say, the, the way the game is organized is essentially slowly killing off that heart and therefore diminishing the spectacle in some ways. Is there some sense that you think there's a contradiction there that, that could actually harm the game or that the game might address in some way, because of, even just because of its damage potentially to the commercial appeal of English football, that if the spectacle starts, if everything starts to feel like the Emirates rather than, than uh, Loftus Road? Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, will they be said, I mean, you know, will they recognize that, you know, uh, they're killing, you know, the goose that laid the golden egg by doing that? I mean, I think a lot of the folks who run English football uh, just don't get it and they don't care. I mean, Roman Abramovich, what does he know? What does he care? He doesn't get it. Stan Kroenke, you know, I mean, these guys just haven't got a clue of that kind of cultural context. And my sense is that they're incredibly insulated from the culture anyway and show no appetite to kind of engage and understand. Uh, are there people inside football at other levels who are going, for average age 47, this is a problem? I mean, yeah, there are people making that noise, but I just see absolutely no effort to address it in any significant way. I mean, and it's worth noting that English football um, recently received a massive boost to its finances from yet another gigantic television deal. They could have could have made every single ticket this year free at every stadium in the Premier League and still had more money than they did last season, such as the increase. But the problem is the prune juice model in that regard is that, you know, where is all the money going? Because it ain't going in profits. Roman Abramovich hasn't made a penny out of it. 44% of income went to players in uh, 1992. Now it's over 75%. In the championship, it's 90%. There are six clubs in the championship below the premiership who are paying more than 100% of their revenue in wages every season. So until we can get some control on that, the idea that we might, you know, make tickets cheaper, nurture a different kind of culture, try and attract a different demographic or a more balanced demographic, um, I don't see that happening. And I'm sort of getting to the point, I'm getting slightly scorched earth about it. I'm kind of thinking, good, I hope Chelsea is so miserable and so quiet that eventually the TV values go down and maybe some of these people will give up in their quixotic quest to make money out of the game. Uh, and then they can bugger off and we can have the clubs back. Um, so I'm sort of getting slightly kind of Marxist millennial about it. It's like, it's like bring on the disaster because I'm not sure how we're going to deal with it otherwise. So.
every, uh, every week. And it cost about, I think at the time, it was probably 12 years, 14 years ago, and it cost like nine Deutschmarks to go. And now it's 10 euros or whatever it is. And it's uh, the atmospheres you talked about earlier um, in, in German football still continue to be, um, you know, one of the best in the world. And yeah. I, I keep reading about English football uh, wanting to copy and mirror that German model now with the financial aspects as well as the the cultural and the you know mm. uh, society aspects. Well, you know, I mean, the left in Britain and indeed the right has been saying we really must copy the Germans for about forty years on everything and look at the state of the British economy. I mean, there are real structural problems with it. Lots of people are talking about this. The first thing is that, you know, there are two things. First of all, the system of ownership. I mean, as I'm sure you know, you know, in Germany, most clubs have to be owned by the amateur organisation. And it just seems to me that's got to be the starting point. I mean, what are football clubs? You know, the stadium, but the stadium changes. Managers go, coaches go. The only thing that makes a football club of any value in the first place when these people stole them is that they are the collective condensed memories and narratives of generations of people who have chosen to invest meaning and emotion in the course of that football club. You know, Without that, none of them are worth anything. Um, and that seems to me a completely absurd thing to be privately owned. How something like that that is collectively produced and reproduced could be turned into a commodity is everything that's appalling about late capitalism. So the Germans are lucky in that they have left over from the social market era, you know, a form of social ownership of football clubs uh, and a fan engagement and fan involvement. And again, uh, Germany is a different kind of capitalism. You know, you've got to have workers' representatives on the boards of large companies. Companies, so you have to have fan representatives on the boards of German football clubs. And at the moment, I don't see any hope uh, of this happening. I mean, the Labour Party is talking about passing legislation to ensure fan representation on boards, which would be a good start. But we've got a very, very long way to go. I think the other thing, you know, we can focus too much on sort of um, institutional mechanisms. They're really important. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there remains a sense of the common good in Germany. A sense that this is not just about Borussia Dortmund or about making profits. This is about a bigger, wider culture of which we are part and which our own experience of which would be meaningless without all of that. And therefore, you know, rich and powerful people in Germany have a degree of social conscience and obligation that simply does not exist. I mean, the English ruling class has become absolutely shameless, is what I would say. They just actually don't care. So, I mean, a good example seems to be in Germany, um, to do a basic coaching course, you know, to get you from nothing to the point where you're coaching kind of kids in a serious fashion, is about 500 euros, right? It's four times the cost in, uh, in Britain. Why is this? Because the Bundesliga recognises that if you want domestic players, a thriving grassroots culture to produce both players, supporters and atmosphere, invest in coaching. And so they subsidise it. The Premier League with loads more money absolutely won't consider it. So, I mean, until we get rid of our ruling elite, I actually don't see much hope for it or until we shame them into it. I mean, again... I find it extraordinary the Premier League clubs will not pay the living wage to um, their catering staff. And it's not like, you know, it's their, um, uh, this is not a business really built on low wage labour. In fact, on the contrary, it's built on very, very high wage labour. And the percentage of the club's turnover or revenue that is taken uh, up by catering staff's wages is minimal. I mean, to actually pay people a decent living wage without whom the spectacle would not happen. I mean, what is it? It's Wayne Rooney's wages for a week. You know, it's a complete joke. But these people, they're unshockable and shameless, and we lack the political institutions to force them to do something about it. So I'm completely with you. Bless Germany. I mean, I love going to German football. It's fantastic. Um, but at the moment, and it is obviously the model to follow, not just in England, absolutely everywhere should follow the German model. Um, but I'm not optimistic. But, you know, we'll, um, I'm hoping, uh, as an aside, I mean, um, I'm uh, helping organise uh, a network of independent fan organisations and supporters organisations, and we're going to try and make some trouble in the run-up to the general election. Uh,
next year on the, on this matter. So we'll do our best, you know. But it's again, it's a problem with England, you know. In politics generally, it's there's this great big mass of depoliticised people who know in their guts that something isn't really right. But oh God, have I got to get involved and deal with it? And it's like England has got to grow up. We have to grow up. We can't just be consumers all the time. We've got to be citizens occasionally. And this goes for like everything in, uh, in, in British society, not just football. But that's the dilemma. And until we basically grow up and stop being a bunch of big kids about it, I don't think we're going to get the change we want. So, and then this gentleman here. Uh, you might know uh, Paul Gilroy's book, Postcolonial Mel Melancholia, um, where he talks about uh, analyzing many features of like contemporary British culture and politics in terms of a kind of a prolonged mourning of the loss of empire. And I'm wondering if part of the attachment that you were, you were kind of discussing across all aspects of British public life, particularly, I'd say, since the, since the new Labour government, uh, has to do with that centrality and to do, you see it kind of coming out, that sense of being central, culturally center, central um, in world affairs. And you see it in this kind of mantra that's always repeated, the, the Premier League is the best league in the world. Um, and everybody's very troubled if that, if that can be shown to be kind of problematic or disputed in any way. Um, yes, post-imperial melancholia. I mean, I think this particularly affects the way in which people think about the England football team rather than, uh, I think it also it affects the way people think and interpret the Premier League. But I think its biggest effect is on the national team where, you know, um, it remains the case that pretty much everyone is convinced until very recently we really ought to be winning everything. And it's like, Really? Honestly, little country, you know, 50 million people, why should we win everything all the time? And I think, you know, we Britain, uh, Britain as a whole has a kind of conception of its importance in the world and its conception of sovereignty that belongs to an imperial period. And it's like, come on, people, wake up. But um, as you will find in the United States, I suspect, it's a very long way down from the top and it takes a really, really, really long time you know, to admit it, let alone uh, engage with it. Um, and I think in terms of sort of pride in the Premier League, I mean, I almost, I sort of almost wish it was like, you know, uh, that it was a replacement for the imperial mission, which at least for all its kind of grotesque racism and colonialism had a kind of moral mission. You might not buy it or like it, but there was something to it. But as the Premier League celebration, it's like celebrating the banking industry. Oh, we've got a really destructive, globally successful industry that poisons our own domestic culture, right, and sequesters the gains of globalization for an incredibly small number of people on the basis of which it is allowed to consistently break the law um, uh, and act in corrupt manners and yet have a um, political regulatory system staffed by its supporters. You know, because the Football Association, which should be regulating the Premier League, you know, is actually full of Premier League representatives who, of course, never make any decisions that would screw them. So I kind of think it rather than uh, it's banking for me that it's closest to. And, you know, um, much of England has bowed down to Mammon and worshipped it. Um, and it's like, yeah, we're making the most money, or, you know, we've got the richest league in the world. And you think, so? Like, and then what? It's like, is it the most exciting? Is it the best to attend? You know, does it make the biggest contribution to society? Is it the most fun? I mean, there are so many other metrics other than just like how much revenue you extract from selling crap in your shop. Um, I find that very depressing um, uh, about it because I don't think that's the only or it should be the main metric. And I think that's in a way you know, the most poisonous thing in uh, in English. And I must say, it's remember, it is about, Eng I mean, England and Britain get very confused here. And sometimes I'm talking about England, and sometimes I'm talking about Britain, and sometimes it's confusing. Because, of course, the meaning of all of this in Scotland, while similar, is also very different. And that's a whole another story. 
this gentleman, then the gentleman in the hat, then the lady here, and I'll take all of your questions and try and answer them all off one at a time in a, in a, in a group. Sir. There we go. Um, you wrote in the end of uh, the Balls Round about, I remember specifically Vietnam and some countries in Southeast Asia and how there's many more eyeballs in it and people watching the Premier League than there are domestic leagues and domestic teams. And it's a problem where actually I think wrestling with someone in the U.S., which is a lot of the you know, dollars that would go to jerseys or eyeballs that would go to MLS are on the Premier League. And there's this sort of a weird snobbishness and kind of a divide among some fans, maybe not all. And I guess I was just curious, what, how do you feel, maybe how should we feel about the globalization of soccer in terms of the talent and the eyeballs that these domestic leagues are withering, even though soccer itself has never been more popular. Um, and is that something we should sort of accept that sort of globalization, free capital, and people are going to go where the money is? Or is that something that maybe governments and leagues should be looking to protect and keep their labor and maybe the, the customers in country more? Great question. So I'm going to take all the questions together. Um, so this description, this thing that you talk about where, um, let's say 50 years ago, cricket was dominant, if you ask people what it would be like, and now it's soccer. So here in this, in, you talk about England needs to grow up, and so you're here in the United States, like the most mature nation on the planet. <laughs> I say that, obviously. You said it. Yeah, well, I say that sarcastically. <laughs> All right, so you, you, you know what I'm saying? So, and here in the United States, you would say that baseball was considered the national pastime. But there's been this evolution over the last 50 years, and American football has become dominant. Mm -hmm. And Ameri what, and there's a lot of theories about why that is, and that really happened also during the Vietnam period. And there's a parallel between the militarization of American culture and the rise of football as a po and replacing baseball. And a lot of that also having to do that baseball is a, an elite sport. If you play professional baseball now, you pay to play in order to become a professional athlete. In America, if you want to be a soccer player, you know, and to play elite soccer on a youth level, you have to pay to play. Both of these guys on either side had gone through that experience. So can you sort of like, is this a, just sort of a, a in, in terms of England and what's going on here in the United States, is this, do you see this just some like latter 20th century, 21st century global capitalism phenomenon and joint militarization and that these sports have shifted, that the culture alongside of it has shifted as well that the economics surrounding the sport has shifted, which also then means that who gets to play the sport has shifted, because soccer in America does not look like America, okay? Baseball in America no longer really looks like baseball. You know, we use other countries to be our factories mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, so I'm going a lot of places, but. <laughs> globalization and, it, and, it, and the malcontents that arise, madam. Hello, this is kind of related. Um, the argument you made about football embodying working class values, etc. do you think it's applicable when football travels to other places that has no such history? Um, and do you think it's like linked to the grammar of football itself or requires this history in the place where it's inserted? Um, what a good question. I don't think it does apply. To answer your question first, I don't think it does apply everywhere, particularly where football has arrived late you know, where it's arrived during a period of industrialization and has its roots in industrial working class cultures. I mean, you know, I think Germany, you know, it's not, it's not a billion miles away the meaning of football in Germany, um, but it's a similar historical trajectory. But here in the United States, clearly football, soccer is many things, but it's not really a blue collar game or one rooted in the experience of the kind of urban working classes of the 20th century. So clearly it takes on, I mean, my sense, you know, um, in, uh, in the United States is that above all, uh, soccer is a cosmopolitan gateway for those who can't bear the nativism of other, of other sports. Uh, and it's the pathway to the rest of the world, you know, in a non-military sense, um, which must be a great relief um, to have that option. Um, so I think it is football in that sense, you know, can take on, can take on a, an extraordinary range of different of different meanings, and it is about sort of partly about timing. Um, as to the globalization questions um, that you've asked, 
I mean, you know, here are the dilemmas of our age. You know, we could be having a not dissimilar conversation about the regulation of capital markets or industrial policy. Should we have tariffs up to protect domestic leagues? You know, should we restrict labor mobility, you know, to build up a domestic league South Korean style until you can ex compete with the export market? I mean, I think there are really, these are important questions. Um, and I think that, I mean, you know, the United States is actually doing pretty damn well in that competition. It's like, look what's happened to Senegal, you know, which would be a, re a better example, um, where, you know, there was a thriving, you know, semi-pro, um, albeit slightly dilapidated football uh, culture and professional league um, in the 1980s and 1990s. And then, you know, they did well at the World Cup in 2002. Suddenly the transfer market woke up to Senegal. Um, and they've all gone. And in fact, wrestling is now by some way the most popular spectator sport in, uh, in Senegal, and football is absolutely nowhere. And again, that's a television thing as well as losing their players. So, you know, the, um, this kind of uh, underdevelopment, as we used to call it, um, is, I think you get it in a lot of places. Um, what is to be done? I mean, you know, it's not for any one culture you know, or any one economy to sort. I mean, this is the problem of global politics, is that we need global democratic institutions where these things can be thrashed out and negotiated. And of course, what we have is FIFA, um, <laughs> which is part of the problem. You know, if we had actually a properly open, transparent, competent, professional, socially inclined, responsive global body, we could begin to have some of these conversations and think, well, okay, if we can't restrict the movement of labor, are there other kind of side payments? Are there ways of defending um, local cultures in the face of globalization? I mean, I think we probably have to accept that the world has changed and we're not going back to completely closed football cultures. We're not going back to closed um, labor markets. You know, I mean, but part of the problem, you know, of all of these kinds of political debates, you know, you get this about regulating Wall Street, is, um, you know, people say there's no alternative. There's no alternative. It just has to be this way. And it's like stage one is saying, hold on, maybe there is stuff we can do. Maybe we can have some kind of labor quotas. Maybe there should be a way that, you know, the premiership basically along the lines of international development aid is recycling some of that money back to the football cultures, you know, that they're relying on. The number of Cameroonians, man, that have played in the uh, Premier League and what is actually Cameroonian football rather than Cameroonian agents and agencies earned out of it absolutely nothing. So I think there are things we could do. We won't know about them until we have the collective courage to say, actually, there is an alternative. Same deal with Wall Street. You know, it would be really helpful if we had an international organization worthy of the name. Unfortunately, we don't have that either. So I'm not hugely optimistic uh, on both of your questions. But on the other hand, that's how I feel about politics generally, and I'm not about to give in. So there's a collective project. And I don't have all the answers. I mean, I think that's the, you know, I really want to emphasize that, um, you know, as enthusiasts and people engaged with this, this is a collective project, you know, and it's only when we start doing it collectively that we gather the intellectual as well as the kind of moral and political strength to start answering these questions. So I'm slightly putting it over to you dudes to say, what do you think? And we will have to work it out together. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, how much does the Bosman regulation has weighted in the in the rise of the Premier League, you know, just three years after it was established, and how does that compare to the rise of other leagues in Europe that that went through the same regulation? And if you have done any comparison, like the the, the schematic description you made of this past 20 years, if you have done something similar either in other parts of Britain or in Germany, Spain, um, Italy is kind of a disaster, France, for example, and, and see how the revenues and you know all the categories that you mentioned, if you've done it in other um, leagues. I've had a look at all of this um, stuff. I mean, I would say the big difference is, the key difference in to other leagues is not really about Bosman. Bosman affects everybody equally. It changes the balance of power between players and clubs and therefore puts more power you know, power to agents, and it's part of a lopsided, insane 
labor market, but it's not the only thing I think that's contributed to that. Uh, I mean, the really key difference, it seems to me, um, is that the uh, Premier League got the selling of TV rights really sorted in a way that the Italians and the Spanish with their non-collective bargaining, you know, it's like Barcelona and Real Madrid, as you know, get everything, or in Italy, the top three. I mean, it was so bad in Italy that you actually had Inter, Juve and Milan giving some money back to the bottom, you know, the bottom teams in the league because the negotiating structure was so unequal that the money was just all going to the top. Whereas the Premier League actually distributes its television money in a relatively egalitarian fashion. You know, and the, the money that comes from foreign sales, which is now the majority of TV income for the Premier League, is distributed, everybody gets the same. Uh, I mean, of course, there are then huge differences to do with ticket prices and size of stadiums. And, you know, in the end, Stoke is just not, Chevrolet ain't paying money for Stoke or Crystal Palace. They're only paying it for Manchester United. Though there's an extraordinary thing. Wasn't Chevrolet mum and apple pie and the stars and stripes in the most serious way for years and years and years? And now it is hitching the bandwagon of the brand to Manchester United? Times change. I mean, I don't quite know semiotically what's going on there, but something pretty interesting is going on there. Um, so, yeah, in answer to conclude, I don't think Bosman makes a huge difference to the Premier League as opposed to other leagues. I think it affects them all equally, and its main consequences is about the distribution of power in the labour market, uh, and part of the reason that players can get away with you know, basically getting ridiculous amounts of money. And not that I'm against them all earning, I should say, you know, football players should all earn great money, right? And everybody and their extended family should be sorted and they should be able to send everyone to college, right? But then after that, I think, enough. Nobody needs any more money, you know? I think we've actually reached a point where Wayne Rooney really doesn't need 35 grand a week. 30 is plenty and we should be spending the five grand on something else and we absolutely have to intervene to deal with that. Um, so I think that's the main thing. And then again, in terms of why the Premier League has done better, I think it is partly maintaining that sort of competitive balance because, you know, it remains the case that Stoke really can give Chelsea a game in the, uh, in the Premier League. And I think the squeezing of, um, of differences in income has been a factor, though not the only uh, factor in that. So, and then this lady here. I think it's on now. Okay. Um, I uh, I bought the ball as round uh, the first the first week when it no the the, the first week when it came out because I was just like wow look at this brick it looks awesome. Um, <laughs> And I have to say, one of the things that I, I just kept reading over and over, because you're a football historian and that's where my question is going to go lead, but about how the game originally looked, how it, the field was massive, and it was like 15 on 15 or something. It was 100, you know, it was just a massive field. It, it, the game they had then doesn't look like anything that we have now with so many rules and everything. Um, and then I'm also a Chelsea fan, which I know I'm going to get booed out of here, but that's okay. Um, but as a Chelsea fan, in uh, Luis Garcia's goal, the ghost goal, now, I'm gonna add, my, my question is about technology and the changing and the evolution of a game as you're a, a football historian. But that goal maybe shouldn't have counted. Um, and then, you know, we have Lampard in 2010 scoring a wonder goal. And that would have changed the game. 2-2 is much different from 2-1. Germany then scores the goal. It's history now. Um, Sir Alex Ferguson recently came out and said that he, he, he's, he's thought about the idea of doing a sin bin instead of just a yellow card and the idea of taking a player off, kind of like what we have in hockey or, or something along those lines. And I guess my question for you as a football historian is, you know, now we have goal line technology in the Premier League, and if you turn on the Premier League now and now you want to start supporting a team, you would think that maybe it was always there. But the truth of the matter is it's really new. And I'm still not sure whether I like it, you know, like, the way the drama happened was that with the telenovela, with Luis Garcia's goal will haunt Chelsea fans forever, but it's now a part of the collective memory. Um, so I guess my question for you is, where do you see, um, what is there, what's going to be the next thing? Is it going to be the idea of the sin bin? Is it going to be a change to the penalty shootout? I was also at the MLS, the first MLS final between DC and LA, and I remember in the pouring rain, them scoring the goal, and that was it. And my father explained to me, oh, that's golden goal, son. And I was like, what about that, that thing when they shoot? Because two years before, I was young enough to remember the 94 World Cup in the final. So I guess my question is, as a football historian, where do you see the game evolving, and what's going to be this new rule that is 
one day going to seem obvious, but it's not going to feel normal when it happens, kind of like uh, go on technology. It may surprise you, given the kind of political complexion I've been presenting to you, that I'm a terrible old conservative when it comes to this. I'm against there being any rule changes. Getting rid of the back pass was a good thing. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't change anything. And I'm militantly against goal line technology. I'm militantly against technology of all kinds. In, uh, because it's like, this is not an exercise in Rawls' theory of justice. This is about generating great narrative. That's what it's about. You know, like if you want justice, like go and do jurisprudence or go to the courts. This is football, for God's sake. You know, and the Frank Lampard, like, I mean, I was in Bloemfontein watching that disgraceful England performance. And thank God it wasn't allowed in because it was really good that England deserved a really good kicking. That was the only just and right you know, outcome, it would have been profoundly unjust if that goal had gone in because England were a disgrace that day. But part of the pleasure, part of the pleasure of that moment was all the Germans going, ah, you remember 1966? So there we are, all of these folks, I mean, most of us weren't alive at the time, having this kind of incredible communication based on a whole series of narratives accumulated over the years. And it's like, who remembers when, you know, the technology, goal line technology said yes or no? That's no good. I mean, really, these people don't understand drama. You know, I want drama, I want injustice. I don't care. I want injustice. I want mistakes. I want things to go wrong. Because that's what makes great stories. And that's what we're there for, aren't we? I mean, in the end, you know, league schmeeg, it doesn't matter in the end. Once you've won it, it's worth the process. How do you get there? How good is the story? How are the twists and turns? That, for me, is the genius and the joy of football. And it's extraordinary unpre unpredictability. And I kind of think, you know, over time it does even out. Sometimes, you know, the great the cliche is, you know, some days you get the call, some days you don't. And great, how brilliant that it's random. What are we all going to talk about afterwards? Oh, what a great piece of technological decision making that was. I'm sorry, that just sucks as narrative. And it's this sort of, you know, it's like they forget that that's really the purpose of the exercise here, is for us to engage. So I am in that regard, I'm absolutely against the intrusion of any technology at all. I'm absolutely against Simbins. I like it when red cards and yellow cards are given unjustly. I think it's great. I like seeing 10 against 11 sometimes, or 9 against 11, or referees basically having to even up the screw up that they made, because it's about humanity. You know, it's about people who make good decisions and then they make bad decisions. You know, and it's like, what do you do with that mix? And for me personally, I wouldn't change a damn thing, really. I, I mean, I quite like the simulation. I love it. Not that I kind of approve of people cheating, but I kind of find the whole debate that then ensues around that, whereas Italian fans will look at that and applaud, right, because they, you know, because the way in which you play politics and you play with the rules in Italy is very different from our conception in Anglo countries of the rule of law, which we take very, very seriously. And I love that contrast. And I wouldn't want to iron those sort of contrasts and comparisons out. Um, you know, so I, was there anything I would change? I would really like to get rid of the mascots, but that's not really a... I'm really against mascots, particularly kind of Disneyland ones. So that's not really a rule change. Um, I really wouldn't change very much, and I definitely, I'm so against golden goals. I can't begin to tell you. You know, and people complain about the penalty shootouts, they're cheap drama. It's like, oh, what, you want expensive drama? Go to the opera. You know, it's like, what's wrong? The game's got to end. I mean, in, in my sort of like fantasy life, I do imagine a situation in which the goal mouth would get bigger and bigger, you know, and eventually would be the entire size of the back line. And then someone's got to score at that point. But I kind of, you know, I'm sort of with Gianni Briera, the great Italian um, journalist, um, you know, who said sometimes the greatest games of all are a nil-nil draw. You know, it can be the excruciating 120 minutes without a goal. And, you know, there are so many different still ways of telling the story. And I, 
I suppose I really like that. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm a fuddy-duddy old conservative old man these days, and I don't really want any change at all. I do want musical instruments, though. I want more musical instruments in this, and them not to be banned. Madam. Working for me. Go for okay, it. Okay, okay, good. Um, yes, I was quite interested in what you mentioned about if the if the sentence is straight, like if you draw the H and you decide where the next H is going to be, it's not straight. Between honest, be honest with the I. Yeah. And I was quite interested in how that relates to like the the things that people write that have their back to their chest. Of course, you can have people like begin with this author, but some sort of On the role model question, um, I mean, certainly in England in the last 30 years, one of the ways in which we have culturally compensated for the sort of obscene levels of uh, wages is to say, oh, you have to be moral guardians as well. And I have to say, I think this is the most terrible failure of our sort of civic imagination. I mean, really, we're going to take a bunch of teenagers you know, and young men who have generally um, ignored their education, gambled massively on, uh, on the possibility of great wealth. And it's like, really? You guys are the moral examples? I mean, I can't imagine anyone who are a worse set of moral examples. You know, why are we not taking, you know, working mothers and fathers and great teachers and serious nurses? I mean, they're the moral, for me, that's the role models. I mean, the idea that Wayne Rooney, bless him, is going to be a role model for anything other than how to be a complete arse is beyond me. Uh, and you're sort of sorry. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, you're saying their role as players. You're saying the differential income of uh, of players somehow affects that. Well, I kind of think you know. Um, I think the best should be paid more. I don't really have a problem. I don't really have a problem with that inside football. I mean, I think the tax authorities should tax them all more heavily. Um, but I think within clubs, I can sort of see why, you know, the best are going to be earning more. I think it's pretty harsh on the people in the lower leagues, and I think there should be a bit more trickle down so that the people, you know, there's a lot of people um, in the lower leagues of football who are not earning a great wage and above all are not getting much of a pension together because this has got to last you your whole life having blown your best years basically playing football. So I think there's a real issue there and I wish that football clubs would pay more attention to the kind of nurturing and education of young footballers to prepare them to deal with all of these which I think is a really terrible failure in England anyway I can't I don't know enough about um, about elsewhere um, I mean I do think it remains the case you know maybe I'm not being cynical enough and I should be but I do think it is extraordinary that despite the incredible sort of individualization of life and the kind of individual acclaim these dudes get and the fact that you know once you've been earning money for a couple of years actually you can do a Winston Bogart can you you know who was at Chelsea and they wanted to get rid of him and Mourinho hated him so much he said you've got to go and train with the youth team which was of course humiliating and he just sort of went okay no problem I'll take my 40,000 pounds a week or whatever so I think it can be sort of 
personally and morally corrosive, just the sort of sheer amount of money these dudes get and their kind of complete inability to know what to do with it sensibly. Um, but I think that's down to, you know, football clubs and the whole academy structure, educating them better. And, you know, I think if we were talking about the Netherlands, it's a very different kind of caliber of footballer that comes through, much more level-headed. You know, I mean, they could still be idiots too, but in general, more level-headed, more balanced, more in touch with the world. And I think that's the thing that really, um, that the money really does, is you just start living in another world. You really lose any kind of connection with how the normal punters of the world are living. And that's, that's not good for anyone. I mean, that's not just footballers. That goes for, you know, senators, prime ministers, you know, chief executives. I mean, that's the problem. You know, there's, there's a real problem when money disengages you so much from the world that your kind of moral compass is completely destroyed. And I think that's the thing I worry about most, rather than the sort of differentials within um, football players' wages. I don't know if that answers your question, but... And so we spoke about the German league and how that's a model. And while financially and through the fans, yes, it's a fantastic model, but what you really have now is Bayern Munich, who have this incredible monopoly on power, who pick apart teams as soon as they're successful. Um, and then you have financial fair play, which sounds well and good, but then you have a team like Manchester City, who goes and buys teams in two different countries so they can off players off their books. So what is the regulation model really? I mean, is, does it have to, like you said, completely be a disastrous bubble burst until we figure it out? Or is there actually a regulation model that we don't have to import from, um, you know, from Germany or from wherever else? Sure. I mean, I think there needs to be a wage cap, you know, not on individual wages, but there's just got to be, you can't have, you know, go from 44% to 75% of the income and as the income is rising, all going to the players and their agents. I mean, I think those guys, you know, um, deserve, you know, great money. I don't have any problem with them and their families being made for life forever. You know, and if they want to waste a lot of money on stupid consumer goods and bad holidays in Dubai, bless them, that's good too. I don't make any judgment on that. Um, but I think we have to call a halt to any more. And, um, you know, it's like, it's just insane. You know, these dudes are taking home $10 million a year and we've got a situation in England where 94% of our um, communal football facilities don't have women's toilets. And it's like, come on, guys. This is, this is an absurd misdistribution. So we really need to do something about it. I think we need um, wage caps. I think we need financial fair play, but we need to play really hardball um, with it and not muck about. And in the end, you know, this is about numbers. I mean, why do the banks always elude the, the regulators. Why do the accountants keep finding the loopholes? Because the state agencies and the public agencies never have enough money, never have enough skilled people, right, and don't have the political will. And I think that's, that's where we need to start. Rather than saying to you, you know, we should do it this way or that way with this regulation, let's start by having democratic institutions that can actually be susceptible to the public will on these matters. Let's actually staff them properly, you know, it's like, let's, you know, check out how many lawyers the NFL has. Uh, I mean, not that that's a guarantee of good practice, but it's a good start if you're in the business. You've got to employ some badass lawyers and accountants, you know, and probably pay them the kind of money they'd get in the city. And then you've got to have some political will. So I think let's start with those three ingredients, and then we can find the policy devices. I think wage, wage caps, you know, on a percentage is a really important part of that. Um, you know, and uh, I think, you know, the corruption that goes on. And there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of cheating. So let's start putting people in prison. I mean, that's the thing, is until people in Wall Street and the City of London start going to prison for fixing LIBOR and fixing the foreign exchange markets, you know, which is like, you know, people are going to prison in Britain for, for you know, claiming $50 more than their welfare check, 
And these guys, you know, are manipulating the global foreign exchange markets and it's like, all oh, slap your wrists. And it's like, it's got to stop. People have got to go to prison. You know, that's what I think. Owners, agents and players. No more fines, no more bans, prison. Prison for the corrupt is what's required. Because, you know, that's where ruling classes need to, need to be afraid sometimes. And that's the thing, they're not afraid because they just feel invulnerable. You know, I mean, I also do what the Ch I take a look out of the Chinese uh, Communist Party, who know a few things about this, is get the tax man onto these people. Let's start going through your books properly, like really properly. Um, and I think that would politically start making a big difference. You know, it's like, oh, really, you want to come to the table now or should we continue this investigation? Uh, I think we've got to start playing hardball with these people because that's how they play it with us. You know, so no prisoners. Two more questions. One of the great joys of the American soccer revolution is uh, how many girls play soccer. Uh, the, you know, what Mia Hamm and, and all those great players that came after her um, have really ignited the interest around the world in women's soccer and in in uh, an empowered generations of, of little girls. I was wondering, in England, um, I would think we, we keep talking, we're talking obviously about the male sport, which, which is where the money is generated and all the attention is going. But uh, if we're truly talking about a, a democratic phenomena, um, what, what is going on in England in terms of the women's sport? Because it's a really interesting moment. I mean, normally I would have begun the answer with, you know, usual litany of disastrous institutionalized sexism, et cetera, et cetera, which of course exists. Um, but it is interesting that for the first time, uh, the women's uh, national team has out outsold the men's national team for their uh, game at Wembley. Um, I think it's 57,000 tickets have been sold at Wembley for uh, uh, England versus Germany women's team. So it's a really interesting moment in that regard. And the women's game has kind of survived and thrived despite rather than because of the kind of support that it's received from uh, the dominant institutions. But it's a good moment. I mean, you know, it's the fastest growing um, team sport amongst women um, and particularly amongst young women very popular. I mean, it's not quite as it is here, but there is a real transformation underway. And of course, you know, American soccer, um, thankfully, didn't have a kind of quite the weight of institutionalized misogyny that exists in English football. And, you know, a lot of levels, not just as participants, but now increasingly as um, broadcasters, as writers, um, as officials, uh, as chief executives of clubs, women are beginning to make the breakthrough. I mean, man, what a slog it is, and the bullshit they have to put up with is just pretty unbelievable. But, you know, as in most areas of life. So I think, you know, it's an interesting moment. I think there is also, you know, a lot of folks who are disillusioned with the over-commercialization of the men's game, or just simply can't get into it. You know, the women's game is opening up new vistas. So. I mean, as so often is the case, you know, we've got, we've got a great moment where all the things are kind of beginning to become aligned. We have a collective choice. We have a political choice. You know, are we going to stand for enduring sexism? Are we going to continue to allow the assholes who run the media industrial complex to be publicly sexist on television? Are we really going to take them on? You know, we have a moment and we could make something really brilliant of it in, uh, in England because I think the energy is there. Um, We'll see what happens, but we have a choice, and that's at least that that at least is an advance. Unless someone else wants to take it, because I don't want to like mess it up. But um, what you were talking about and what you've been talking about that's happening in the '80s and '90s in England is sounds similar to a lot of the arc that was happening in other countries earlier. When we talk about in football nation, the elevation of the sport into politics and culture in Brazil in like the 40s and 50s that you're talking about in England in the 80s. In all those countries, the arc ends with now everyone just watches the Premier League in all of those countries. And the domestic leagues are suffering. But it's not possible for that to happen in England because there's nowhere else to go. So you talk about that, 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 that potential tragedy that will end, and then maybe the sport can get back around. But how is, could that possibly occur if there's really nowhere else for the world's fans to go? 
Have you been to the Emirates recently? I mean, well, not just the Emirates. I mean, the Emirates is traditionally castigated for being, you know, the quietest and least atmospheric stadium. But I had the terrible misfortune to be at Chelsea versus Arsenal at Stamford Bridge a few weeks ago um, with Dan, I think, who just arrived. And I think, I mean, Chelsea it was... It was really extraordinary, you know, as someone who sort of grew up in the 70s and 80s for whom Chelsea is a byword for kind of raucous and rude and racist proletarian noise. I mean, it was like being at a dinner party. It was absolutely absurd. The Arsenal, I mean, if it wasn't for the Arsenal away fans, it would have been, it would have been silent. I mean, apart from when the goals, and I have to say, you know, there is the, that, that is the end, is that when, you know, um, the atmosphere of the stadiums becomes so poor that it actually affects the commercial spectacular. And I know, you know, deep in Sky HQ, Rupert Murdoch is desperately trying to genetically engineer um, fans or digitally create fans. But um, I think, you know, that's, that's, that, that is possible. And it's worth noting, I mean, Chelsea are now, the level of tourism, uh, at these games is extraordinary. I mean, obviously not at Sunderland in quite the same way. But Chelsea is probably, you know, 5% of the audience now are kind of, you know, foreign day trippers who've come in, you know, for an expensive weekend in London and Chelsea's part of the itinerary. And, you know, even the cop can be silent. I mean, it's really, you know, the cop. But even when you've been good... You know, it can be, it can be crap. I mean, at the at its best, the COP and you know Newcastle and some of the stadiums, it still has got that unbelievable kind of collective ecstasy buzz energy. But I'm sensing it less and less often, and for shorter and shorter durations. And um, I mean, maybe the world will want to watch. You know. English football played in front of foreigners and the local wealthy in virtual silence. Um, maybe they will, um, but I don't. I kind of. I kind of think not. And we are. We're not quite at the tipping point yet. But you know, like I said, the audience is 46 now, average age, and going north. And what happens when it's 50? What happens when it's 55? You know. Really, is that going to be a good atmosphere? Nothing wrong with 55-year-olds or someone approaching their 50th birthday terribly rapidly. Bless the 55-year-olds of the world. But I do, I do think that might be the point at which it really begins to fall apart. I mean, I've got to the point, I don't really, I don't really, you know, I go to the Premiership and see Premiership games sort of slightly dutifully, you know, but what I really enjoy is going and seeing lower league football where there's still some rough and tumble and there's still, you know, the edges haven't been polished and where, you know, there's still a bit of noise. Um, we will see. Maybe my tastes are too esoteric and old-fashioned and that the next generation will be happy with a slightly kind of plastic version of the past. But um, I kind of doubt it. So I think, you know... We'll have to come back in 10, 15 years and see where we are. But I think that is the possibility. And then whether people stop watching, I don't know. We will, we will see. Are we done? Thank you very much, guys.